Finding the perfect partner is a challenge in itself. You want to look for someone that loves you, complements your persona, as well as your interests. However, in the quest to find those we love, there arrive certain situations that put us in quite the creepy predicament. That's why on today's episode of Scary Stories, we'll be taking a listen to some crazy and scary ex-boyfriend and ex-girlfriend stories that are going to chill you to the bone. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Number 1. My Yandere Ex-Girlfriend Finding the perfect person to love. A combo of patience and trying to find that special someone. It was a common theme that had been out of my reach for so many years. After my girlfriend of five years had passed, I was left in a pretty bad spot. I can remember all the days I would just look up to the sky and go, Wow, she's really gone. But after about three years, your heart begins to heal, and you begin to realize you can't reminisce about the past forever. Truly, she would want you to be happy and move on, right? That was something many of my close friends told me, and it appeared I was ready to start dating again. Unfortunately for me, the person I would meet would end up causing me more harm than good. Allow me to begin. This occurred in 2017 when I was 25 years of age. Also, just to quickly add, a male. My friends had introduced me to an app called Tinder. It's pretty notorious nowadays as being a place for people to meet up for just a one-time fling. I was foolish enough to think I could use this app as a replacement to IRL dating, as I was now my credentials program, and dating was very difficult. So anyway, I ended up making an account and instantly got matched with a couple of other females my age. One girl in particular, who we're going to call Emma, really caught my eye. She was really pretty. She had short ginger, red hair, freckles, and green eyes. And the best part was she was within a 25 mile radius. I remember spending the next two hours thinking of what I wanted to tell her, finally deciding with just a hello and nice to meet you. I was honestly expecting her to ghost me, but she replied to me later that evening. Hey, it's very nice to meet you too. My name's Emma. Well, we hit it off pretty well, and we ended up talking until about two in the morning leaving the conversation with a date. The day arrives and we ended up meeting at an olive garden. Luckily, she was who she claimed to be in the photos, which was something I did have a bit of paranoia about, especially after hearing all those catfish stories. Nevertheless, everything had been going smoothly until I started to notice the waitress begin to flirt with me, as if it wasn't obvious I was on a date, which I made very clear. Either way, Emma started to grow angry, and she said under her breath, Just try touching his shoulder again. I'll take this knife and put it through your hand. I laughed it off as just a way of her joking, but little did I know as to how much of a jealous type she was. When the waitress returned to bring the check, she completely ignores Emma's presence, and she does that flirtatious touch-my-shoulder thing again. Emma lost it. Her face went from nice and innocent to that of a yandere. If you don't know what that means, look it up. Anyways, she grabbed a butter knife from the table and she lunged toward the waitress, which thankfully, she didn't actually attack her. She did, however, curse her out at the top of her lungs, which caught the attention of a couple of the other patrons, who then began to form a crowd. I recall begging Emma to just relax, and she eventually did once the waitress left and another waiter took our bill. I'll admit, it was quite scary having to take the butter knife away from her and watching her go from absolutely angry back to happy and friendly. I know what you might be thinking. It's time to move on. That would have been the smart thing to do. But she apologized profusely, saying it was a one-time lack of judgment and it would never happen again. I'll admit, her adorable face with those teary and beady eyes just kept me from saying no. Thus, I decided to meet up with her on another date. A week later, we ended up becoming official, and we started to see each other a lot more often. Fast forward to one evening, where I had been at home helping my sister pack things into boxes as she was going to be moving out. Emma ended up texting me that evening and asking if we were still going to be hanging out later that night. I'd made it very clear I was unable to set up any plans 
since I would be at home assisting my sister with moving out. Well, around 7-ish p.m., both my sister and I were outside, putting the boxes she had packed back into the back of her Volkswagen. I remember her breaking down with tears, being sad to be moving out, as she was going to be studying a few states away. We embraced for about a minute, as I wished her all the best of luck, and I gave her advice. Out of nowhere, however, we noticed headlights pull into our driveway. I recognized the vehicle immediately, as Emma's. Very unexpected, we thought, but hey, at least it would give me an opportunity to introduce my sister to her. I didn't really get the chance to do that, because it seemed Emma had noticed our hug, and seemed to have mistook my sister for some other girl. Emma walked up to both of us, then slapped me, then my sister. How dare you put your hands on him? Who do you think you are? Emma, this is my sister, Haley. You two haven't met yet. She's gonna be moving. Emma was embarrassed and began to apologize, but that wasn't what scared me. I looked at her fist, and I could see she had put her keys in between her knuckles as if she was ready to attack. She must have noticed I saw this because she instantly puts the keys into her pocket and explains that's how she always held her keys. Haley proceeded to tell Emma off, where at one point I had to get involved, because Emma pushed Haley again, knocking her to the ground. Emma, that's enough. You need to leave. This is unacceptable. If you thought her previous meltdowns were crazy, you haven't seen anything. She went after me and started to scratch and claw at my arms with the keys. All the while, Haley had returned to the house. Emma, get off of me. That's enough. You need to go home, now. She doesn't say anything else. She power walks back to her car and then runs into our mailbox before leaving. I was now left with a bunch of scratch marks, absolutely confused at what caused her sudden rage. I did ultimately tell her I was breaking up with her over text message, which I know is the worst thing you can do. I'm so sorry. Please, don't leave me. I don't know what I could do without you. What really sent me chills was how she said she wouldn't want to continue on if I ended the relationship. Sorry, but even though I'd fallen in love with this girl, she had this other personality that made life very difficult. That was it, and I breathed a sigh of relief hoping she would finally move on in her life. But boy, was I wrong. A couple of nights later, when I was out from class, I walked over to my car, and I accidentally dropped my keys. As I get back up, I notice something on the door handle. I went ahead and took my phone out and shined it on the handle to see a razor blade seemingly just taped there. I knew this couldn't have been any normal person. It had to be Emma. Not that I had to wait too long. I'm not even joking. This part is not a lie. I started to hear noise in the surrounding bushes. Only for moments later, Emma to jump out of said bushes, brandishing a knife. Well, I unlocked my vehicle, making sure to avoid the razor blade, and I storm out of there, heading toward the police station. I must have been there for hours, but to save you all the details, I ended up filing a restraining order. Yeah, I know it sounds kind of lame for a guy to do that, but there was another reasoning to it. You see, that same night I drove to the police station, she sent me a bunch of very scary messages on Facebook, one of them just so happened to be a picture taken in my house. It was a selfie where I was sleeping in bed and she was smiling holding a knife. That gave me such chills since I hadn't heard her break into the house. Neither did my parents. Safe to say with the involvement of police and Emma's parents who on the contrary were some of the sweetest people I'd ever met, she was able to get some help and I have never heard from her again. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying today's episode. Before we continue, let's take this opportunity to thank my channel members, Robbie, Bo, Kim, and Spunky the Nutcase. If you'd like to help support what I do here, along with getting early access to new videos, then check out the channel memberships option. It's right next to where it says subscribe. Anyways, let's continue. Number 2. Catfished by my ex. I used to date a girl named Christine back during my years of college. That started in late 2010 and ended 
in 2013. I remember how deeply and madly in love we were. It was very early on in the relationship. We started talking about getting married and having a family. Even three months in, she was already looking into wedding rings. I know it sounds pretty ridiculous, but I sort of enjoyed her obsession. It really helped with my confidence. Thing is, I'd gone through a pretty bad heartbreak in high school, which was why the time with Christine felt so special. However, even with all of those nice things said, I started to notice a change in Christine. She would grow very jealous any time I spoke with a girl. At first, I blamed it on her just being protective, but there was an instance that really drove a separation. One of my classmates, who were going to call Sarah, ended up texting me a bunch of screenshots of her Facebook inbox. There were various messages from Christine that were very intimidating and downright creepy. Examples as mild as stay away from my boyfriend to I'm going to kill you. I ended up showing Christine the messages the following morning and she claimed it was all a lie made up for my classmate. I didn't believe her and after much pressuring, she gave in by crying and saying she just didn't want me to leave her. This jealousy would continue for the following months, putting me on lockdown so to speak. We couldn't go out together without her snapping at waitresses or employees at stores. And bear in mind, I'm not even the best looking dude in the world. If anything, I was the one who thought Christine would leave me. Finally though, I had enough and I told her we needed a break. That break lasting for about two months, where ultimately, I was the one to put the final nail in the coffin so to speak. That should have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. Christine started to send me very threatening messages. They were even worse than those she sent to my classmate Sarah. She was talking about doing harm to others, and even herself. That caused me to block her on all social media, and slowly it seemed that her manipulative character became a thing of the past as I started to move on. Fast forward about six months later, I started to use a dating application, and I met a girl named Madison. She had a few pictures and she seemed pretty sweet. After about a week I asked if we could FaceTime, but she told me she was unable to since her phone didn't have a good camera. Pretty dumb excuse to be perfectly honest, but I let it slide, asking instead if we could just do a phone call. She was pretty hesitant about that too, and she made up an excuse of losing her voice. That frustrated me a lot. And I told her I wasn't looking to waste my time with someone who couldn't even make an effort to speak with me. Yeah, I sort of reached a point where I wasn't having people's nonsense. It was either be straight up with me, or I'm moving on to bigger and brighter things. Not that using a dating application was the best decision. Anyways, I blamed my anger on previous relationships and gave her more chances. A few months ended up passing, and I really started to fall in love with her. Albeit, I haven't even talked to her other than by text. I remember confiding in Madison, telling her all of my secrets, as well as my past relationships, thinking, this could be the girl. One day I asked her if we could meet up in person, and maybe we could have dinner or grab coffee, and she actually agreed. Thus we set up a date and time at a coffee shop for that Friday evening. The day arrives, I walk into the store, full of confidence and a bit of nerves as I take my seat with my nice hot cocoa eagerly awaiting the arrival of Madison. Ten minutes passed since our supposed meetup time. Nothing. Thirty minutes, still no signs of Madison. I finally texted her at the 45 minute mark and she told me she was just about to enter. So imagine my surprise that instead of this Madison girl, my ex, Christine, walks in and then starts to head in my direction. Please, please tell me she's just coming to say hello, please. I begged, thinking perhaps this was just some creepy coincidence. Robbie, hi, it's good to see you again. Hi Christine, long time no see, huh? What are you doing here? Robbie, I'm Madison. Wait, what are you talking about? I'm... I am the girl you've been talking to this entire time. I was so devastated, but I was angry 
to think that I wasted many more months talking to not only a catfish, but Christine, of all people. You bet I stormed out of that coffee shop, not even being embarrassed with my sudden outburst. Christine followed me to the parking lot and then told me to please give her another chance. Wasn't going to happen. But just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, something seemed to have snapped in her mind when she takes out a pocket knife from her jacket and then she uses the handle to begin smashing at my driver's window. Time froze as I just sat there in the driver's seat thinking, what in the world had I gotten myself into? Luckily, I snapped out of it and I drive out of that parking lot, heading back home full of various emotions. That night, I'm not ashamed to say, I broke down and started to cry, something my parents were very concerned with. However, our concerns were about to get a checkup, when about 20 minutes later, Christine drives to her home and then begins pounding on my bedroom window, begging I take her back. That was it for me. I ended up calling the police, but unfortunately by the time they got there, she had already left. That wasn't without her completely destroying all of our Halloween decorations. Anyways, this is becoming a little too long, so I'll go ahead and wrap everything up. After I got a restraining order, I never heard from Christine again. I did talk to a mutual friend who knew her better, but she claimed she started to date some other guy. He was apparently a football player by the picture she sent me. Not that I couldn't confirm myself since she had blocked me on all social media. Well friends, that's my story about the time I had a crazy ex-girlfriend and then got catfished by said ex-girlfriend. I'll admit, I have taken a break from dating and I've instead focused on working in the Peace Corps. I'm actually writing this up during my two week break and it feels pretty good to get it off my chest. I hope you enjoyed. And as one final reminder, please be careful with people you date. Don't be afraid to stand up for yourself and draw the line when there's a problem. Sure, in some situations you might be with somebody because of comfort, but do you really want to live that way the rest of your life? It might be tough if you just leave, but that's going to save you so much heartbreak in the long run. Number 3 Ex High School Sweetheart I met my ex-girlfriend in high school about 8 years ago when we were both seniors. For a while we had quite the thing going and we spent almost every single day together. Whether it be shopping, going to watch a movie, or just sitting on the couch surfing through channels, we were pretty much as my mom best described it, stuck together like glue. I think one nice thing with my ex, which I'll go ahead and call her Samantha in the story, is she really made an effort to meet my family. This was something they really appreciated, as the girlfriend I had before her didn't bat them an eye. Speaking of appreciation, she didn't appreciate any time I would go out with friends. Don't even get me started with bringing along girls. She despised them and she said that if she ever found me hanging out with another female that wasn't a family member, she was going to kill them. I laughed it off the first time she said that as we were having breakfast, and no joke, she took the steak knife from my plate and slammed it right into the table. That's going to be you if you don't take me seriously. It genuinely freaked me out, but again, I tried not to focus much on her sudden change of behavior. Anyways, it got to the point when any time a friend invited me to go somewhere, I always had to say no, in fear of what Samantha was going to say. Yes, laugh at me all you want, but I really loved her. She was very beautiful, and I was in such a mindset where even I wasn't sure what I would do without her. Maybe that's not the best combination, but whatever. There was once where my grandma was in the hospital and Samantha got mad that I was spending so much time with her. It's like seriously, she's family, what's the deal? Luckily it was only a minor health issue and she recovered after a couple of weeks. But my grandma's little scare did really take a toll on me. It really made me think that at any time you could lose somebody so special and close to you. That's why I felt bad for all the times I wouldn't go visit her 
or even give her a call just to see how she was doing. So naturally, I was in a pretty bad state of mind. Anyways, things only seemed to deteriorate in my relationship when we had constant fights about the most mundane things, such as why I didn't respond to her calls or text messages, even though I was working two jobs and going to school. Of course, I was going to take naps anytime I could, and when I wasn't, I was working or studying. I mean, come on. I made sure to talk to her anytime I could, making sure to wish her a good morning and a good night. Nevertheless, on one of these fights, she actually came at me with a pair of sharp scissors, and she managed to leave me with a pretty nasty scar on my hand as I tried to take them away. Don't even get me started with how deep the scissors went, the pain, because I don't think I even want to describe it. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore, and I ended the relationship after about seven months. A week after the breakup, I was home alone and around 8 p.m. in the evening, I was able to hear my back glass sliding door being opened. Just a quick note, we were having issues with that door, and if you pushed it hard enough, you were able to slide it open. I was in my room drawing in my sketchbook when I heard the noise. Assuming it was my parents, I went to meet them, only instead to be met with something even more terrifying. It was Samantha holding a baseball bat. Well, she gave me a creepy smile, and she then started smashing everything in her sight. I heard glass being shattered, along with the walls being banged up. By now, I was locked in my room and had moved my dresser so that I could block her from entering. She actually attempted to get in, but she was unsuccessful. Anyways, when I called police, they got there as she was exiting my home, and they ended up talking with her for a while. I just couldn't believe she had the nerve to tell them I was the reasoning for her actions. Luckily, I was able to clear my name when I showed police all of her scary and violent messages, along with a nasty scar on my hand. I never did find out what happened after that, but I did see her for a few weeks at school, but she avoided talking to me altogether. Once the semester ended and we graduated, that was it. So, I don't know where she is today. As I mentioned in the beginning, this all happened about 8 years ago, and I've since moved out of state. I'm also happy to report I've gotten married to my wonderful wife Alexis, and we have a baby boy on the way. Number 4 Ex-Boyfriend Breaks In Hey there. For one, I wanted to say hello, I love your videos. And two, I wanted to go ahead and send you in a story that regards my first ex-boyfriend. This happened around 2005 when I was in college. I'd actually been late to the game when it came to relationships, and I didn't start dating until I was 21. That was when I met a guy named Christopher in my biology class. He was such a sweetheart when I first met him. And it started off by just sitting next to each other on the first day. And then slowly it evolved into going on dates. I still remember the way he asked me out. He showed up to one of my classes with some of his friends who played guitar. And they sang me a song they came up with together. At the very end, Christopher asked me to be his girlfriend. And I, being the sappy girl I was, broke out in tears and said yes. After that, we started to grow more comfortable around each other. He would bring me flowers at work, and he'd stay up all night to talk to me, even when he had to wake up early for class. Things started to change around the three-month mark, when he started to become a little too obsessive. Don't get me wrong, we talked a lot, but it was getting to the point where I couldn't get any of my daily activities done. If it was more than 15 minutes without a response, he would text me back with messages such as, What's taking you so long? You probably don't even love me anymore, do you? That was combined with pressuring me never to hang out with any other friends. If they were men, forget it. He would downright tell them off. Even went as far as to tell my childhood best friend Jason that if he ever saw me hanging out, let alone texting me again, he would personally show up to his house with a pistol. You can imagine the rest. This monitoring by Christopher is best described as if I was stuck behind bars in a jail. Anyways, all of this was starting to take its toll on me, and I found it very difficult to focus as everything seemed to center around Christopher. 
This brought about the constant fighting in which I was always blamed for every single thing. Christopher's lack of confidence. Well, apparently that was my fault. You're just so beautiful. I don't ever want to lose you to anyone. I wouldn't know what I would do if you left. This went on for another six or seven months, and it just got worse. Anytime I told Christopher we needed a break from the relationship, he would just downright lose it. I remember once he punched some random stranger in frustration over what I had told him. Christopher wasn't exactly the most tough guy in the world, so little did he know the guy he punched was a wrestler at the local community college. Safe to say, Christopher ended up with a cast on his arm. Oh, and guess what? He blamed that on me while calling me all the names in the book. And I'm not talking about the nice things. Eventually, after almost a year, I finally had the courage to call things off. What a surprise when he just looks at me and says, Okay, that was it. For real, I found it a little too suspicious. After all, here was this guy who was overly obsessed about me. Now he was just going to seamlessly move on? Not exactly. A few nights later, I was out with my mom, my dad, and my uncle at a Red Lobster, celebrating my dad's promotion. When we arrived home about an hour later, we saw a familiar car parked on the other side of the street. It was the same Honda Accord that Christopher drives. However, there was no signs of Christopher. There was, however, a sign of entry, as one of the windows had been left open. My dad is the first person that will ensure everything in the house is locked up before we leave. That's why he grabs his pistol from the glove compartment, and both him and my uncle start to do a scan of the house. Meanwhile, my mom and I are calling police as a precaution. It didn't take too long after my dad and uncle entered the house to find Christopher hiding under my bed with a bowie knife. Police ended up arresting Christopher, and I filed a restraining order against him. That was essentially it. He was barred from ever contacting me again, and if he ever got within a certain distance, he would be locked up indefinitely. Anyways, that was almost 15 years ago. Since then, I have moved across the country, and I live a happy and wonderful life in rural Kentucky. Number 5. Ex-Boyfriend Stalker Back in 2013, when I just began my first semester of college, I got a job working for a Halloween store. It was only temporary employment, as it was seasonal, but it did allow me to branch into other places of employment, such as working for Sears. But I digress. I only want to focus on the time I worked at the Halloween store. Just for a quick background on me, I used to be the type of girl who refused to go out to public places. Forget the panic attacks, I found it downright impossible to have a basic conversation with strangers. That's why when my aunt pushed me to get the job, I was pretty hesitant. You see, my aunt was actually the manager, which ended up being a good thing, as she helped me get used to working. I'll tell you. She snapped me into place right away, because after less than a month, you couldn't get me to stop talking. It's like a switch flipped in my mind, from introvert to extrovert. Seriously, I recommend anybody who might be the shy type, give working a shot. You'd be surprised without just doing something. We'll get you out of your tough time. Anyways, after a month, we ended up hiring a new guy, who we're going to call Maxwell. He was the typical skater dude. He was tall and skinny. He had long brown hair and also a love for, you guessed it, skateboarding. We hit it off pretty well, talking about our favorite movies as well as the video games we enjoyed playing. Turned out we were both Gears of War fans and soon we added each other on Xbox, playing every single night after work. A few weeks before the Halloween store was going to close for this season, he ended up asking me out on a date, and at the end of the night, he asked if I would be his girlfriend. I was crying, because it was the first time in my life I'd ever been asked out by anyone. Here I was, this shy and skinny nerdy girl, actually being noticed for once in her life. Of course, I ended up saying yes, and we spent the next few months doing your typical boyfriend and girlfriend activities. 
He even introduced me to skateboarding. After about a year, I decided to end the relationship due to his constant partying. There were plenty of times we would meet up only for him to either be completely wasted or high off his rockers. Trust me, I tried to give him a chance as this being him living his young college years, but I wasn't all about that sort of life. Also, it had gotten bad since he started to hang out with a biker gang who constantly went out to bars. But the breaking point was when I found out he cheated on me with my best friend, and they weren't even sneaky about it. She ended up gloating in my face, talking about how easy I was to manipulate, which really brought back my anxiety. To think, I was doing so well. I'd even started the job at Sears and had already moved my way up to assistant manager. Well, the next few months were a downward spiral for me, as my friends and family did all they could to see me happy. Anyways, it was about five months after the breakup, I ended up meeting somebody else, who I'm actually married to at the moment. He's in the Marines, and he's the sweetest man I've ever come to know. Not only is he very trusting, but he would support me even when I was having a bad day. Something Maxwell had done nothing of it was always about him. So at this moment you might be wondering, did anything else happen between myself and Maxwell? I'm glad you asked, because it did. After I started my new relationship, naturally I started to post some photos on my Instagram so that I could show my friends I was once again happy. They were all very supportive of me, and I appreciated all their well wishes. However, in between those positive vibes, I ended up getting a notification from a username I didn't recognize. It was Maxwell, which at the time we were dating, we hadn't used Instagram. The messages were of him asking for my forgiveness and wanting to know if I could give him another chance. I told him I was already in another relationship and I wasn't wanting to deal with a cheater. Once I told him that, he admitted to his mistakes before blaming it all on me. Go figure. I proceeded to block him right there and then, hoping his nonsense would cease. The conversation, however, would extend to my cell phone, which I should note, I had changed my number, so somehow he had got it. I blocked him on there shortly after the messages were sent, and then things went quiet for about two weeks. Fast forward to the evening of my little sister's birthday party. I just clocked out of work, and I was heading to the parking lot. As I got closer to my vehicle, I noticed somebody standing next to it. I was shocked to see it was Maxwell. There you are, honey. I've been waiting for you this entire time. Won't you come back to my place? Maxwell? No, I already told you. It's too late. Now can you please just leave me alone? He wasn't. I stood my ground, however, clenching onto my pepper spray I kept on my purse. Well, if you won't go with me willingly, then I'll just take you with me by force. Maxwell took out a pocket knife, and then he started to approach me. I had no choice but to use the pepper spray, as he was within just a few inches of my face. Naturally, he screamed as I quickly run over to my door, hop in, then call my manager, who was still inside the building. He comes out less than 30 seconds later with one of the security guards, who manages to subdue Maxwell. Maxwell, however, gets out of his grasp, and he runs over to some nearby apartments. All of this, mind you, after being pepper sprayed. Seriously, the determination. Anyways, funny enough, there were a couple of officers responding to a disturbance, so we were able to notify them of what had taken place. And they took all of our statements, as EMTs were helping Maxwell with his eyes. That was the last time I ever heard from Maxwell, which... Good riddance, I say. Before we get to the final story, I just wanted to go ahead and give you all a quick reminder. If you're ever looking for extra content, whether it be art, previews, or sneak peeks, then make sure to follow me over on my Instagram, at the Creepy Fox Official. Thank you, I'll see you there. But for now, let's get on to our final entry. Number 6. Coming Back for the Wrong Reasons 
It was January 2016 when I first met Samuel at my job, working at Costco. He worked in the deli section while I worked in the front as a cashier. Anyways, we were on break when it happened. He complimented my phone case, which was of an anime I really loved. Safe to say, that was all it took for us to hit it off. And after about a week, we started to hang out after work. We went out to dinner, went to the movie theater, and hung out at his house. After about a month, we became official. So far, there wasn't really anything that indicated Samuel was a bad person. After all, he was always doing everything for me, as I did the same back. It wasn't too long, however, before he began to spin me around his finger, as the good old saying goes. One time, my friend Trish invited me to her birthday party, and naturally, I had brought along Samuel, so she could meet him. At the party were a couple of my old friends from high school, who I hadn't seen in many years. Naturally, they were happy to see me, so they gave me hugs, as well as compliments. Samuel didn't exactly take this too lightly, as he got into a fight with a few of them. At first, it was just an argument, but then it escalated to Samuel grabbing a wine bottle, smashing it against a table, and then using the sharp end to go after my friend James. Luckily, a huge group of the guys managed to interfere before things got too out of hand. My friend James did have to get some stitches, though. Surprisingly, he didn't press charges. The next day, I had a serious talk with Samuel. And I told him that he couldn't just be going around attacking my friends just because they gave me hugs. He apologized, blaming his insecurities and promises it would never happen again. Safe to say his anger and manipulative nature ended up continuing. He barred me from talking to other guys, and he even wanted me to show him who I was talking to any time I was texting. I later found out that he secretly installed an application which allowed him to see what I was doing on my phone. Something I ended up bringing up when I later found it in one of my folders, one that I never checked. That was the breaking point for me. Not only did I quit my job, but I broke up with him, telling him to never contact me again. I'm sorry, but even I knew that was becoming a little too much. I didn't mention this yet, but along with what looked to be his constant obsessions, he would always call me the most terrible things you can possibly imagine, and then he would twist it on by saying he was just joking. I'll tell you one thing, I sure wasn't laughing. Enough with that part. On to the day when my life would be forever changed. I was just arriving from school, and I happened to see a couple of police cars parked in my driveway. I also saw my mom and little sister who were talking to some of the officers on the front porch. Obviously, I was confused to what was taking place, so I park, and I walk over to check. My little sister comes crying over to me, as one of the police officers soon explains what had taken place. My ex showed up to my house with a revolver and broke in, demanding to see me. I'm just so thankful he didn't do anything to my sister and my mother, but he did lock himself in my room. About 45 minutes of back and forth, and the officers eventually got him to surrender. Talk about creepy. Last I heard, Samuel has been spending time in jail for multiple charges, and we have since moved away. Edit. For those wondering, I had a bunch of missed calls from my mother the night that Samuel broke into my house, but I wasn't able to see them since my phone battery had pretty much ripped. Hello, hello everybody. What is going on? It is the Creepy Fox wanting to say thank you for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Now you're probably wondering, why is the Creepy Fox on camera? Isn't he usually just before... Ah, I can't even speak right now. Isn't he usually behind this uh, microphone? And uh, yes, you are correct in assuming that most of the time I'm behind just the uh, microphone. But um, I just wanted to take this quick moment to personally talk to all of you. I know right now there's a lot of crazy stuff happening in the world and people are just like, Ugh. I mean, no, it's, it's kind of serious. But um, I just wanted to let everybody know that I'm personally here for all of you. Um, if you need somebody to talk to, 
feel free to leave me a message, uh, whether it be a comment on this video, you can send me a message over on my Instagram, you can email me, whatever you like. Times are kind of uh, rough right now, and I feel like if we can get through this together, I think we're going to be good. So, um, you know, let's try to get away from all the madness, as they say. Let's listen to some scary stories and relax. So like I said, I want to say thank you to everybody for watching and supporting, and um, I will see you all in the next video. So until then, take care, and let's get on to the typical outro. Super cool transition inserted here. Woo! Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.